Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. TOS is one of the most common upper extremity afflictions that have to do with nerve pain. Now a lot of people think it's rare and it's interesting how those physicians who generally don't see it often regard it as very rare, whereas those who are experts in its identification proclaim it as a common disorder, common upper extremity neuropathic disorder. Now what is thoracic outlet syndrome? Thoracic outlet syndrome is a problem where compression of the brachial plexus and subclavian vasculature occurs through the scalenes and also through the SEM for the vein, underneath the collarbone between the first rib and the collarbone and then underneath the pectoralis minor. The pec minor more so for the vasculature. Now, TOS, as I stated, is regarded as a diagnosis very difficult to diagnose. Most of the experts diagnosing thoracic outlet syndrome are heart surgeons, well, cardiothoracic surgeons in their 50s and 60s and above, really. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that you generally don't have a lot of uh, clinical support from electrodiagnostic studies being um, EMGs and CVs, but also generally not from imaging studies. It is estimated that around 5% of TOS cases are vascular, 5 to 10%. In other words, up to 90 or 95% of TOS cases are neurogenic. In strong cases of vascular affection, you can see evidence of this on um, vascular imaging, especially on a properly done Doppler examination, which we're going to get back to later. But generally, there's not a lot of um, good imaging testing evidence, so to say, for thoracic outlet syndrome. So it has to be rendered on a clinical diagnosis, and today we're going to talk about, well, in brevity, the clinical approach to diagnosing uh, thoracic outlet syndrome and some common pitfalls. So what is the main clue for thoracic outlet syndrome? Well, thoracic outlet syndrome should be regarded as a plexopathic disorder that triggers generally with arm loading. So most of these patients, they will say that they have pain when they're cleaning the windows or uh, cooking, it could be carrying groceries, using a backpack, bench pressing, and the symptoms are going to be diffuse. Some just have pain in the neck, others have it in the chest, others between the shoulder blades, some in the shoulder, some in the arm or hand, some all of them, some just some of them, but it triggers with arm loading. So the first step is to get the cervical MRI and make sure that there, are, there is no explanatory disc lesions, i.e. no disc prolapse or similar pathology in the neck that can cause root compression. Now, root compression generally doesn't worsen with arm loading, uh, it tends to worsen with with uh, awkward neck position. For example, for the, for uh, radiculopathy or uh, disc protrusions causing uh, nerve compression, you have something called a Spurling's test, where you put your neck back, and the clinician is going to push down on your head to cause that axial compression to the spine, and it reproduces the radicular pains. In TOS, that's not really what the that's not really the trigger we're looking for. We're looking for worsening with articulation and loading of the arms. And if you have a patient who has pain in the chest or shoulder blade, arm or hand, and they say that they get worse every time they're loading their arms, like in the gym, carrying groceries and so on, and the MRI of the neck is normal, that should greatly increase your suspicion for thoracic outlet syndrome. Now there are some clinical tests that we will do with thoracic outlet syndrome. So first of all, we need a compatible clinical uh, history, i.e., do you have worsening with arm loading? That, that's really the main, main uh, point giving you suspicion, and a normal cer cervical MRI. 
Then we're going to do something called, uh, well, I will do a Tylenol test. So I will go over the various nerves of the arms. I can push the, onto the radial nerve. I will go into the musculocutaneous nerve. I can push into the, into the musculocutaneous nerve in the bicep as well, the median nerve under the pronated teres and so on. And I look for abnormal amount of elicited pain upon pressure. Most TOS patients, not all because some are numb, but most of them, they will have abnormally low thresholds to pressure. So when you push them, you give them just a light tug there in, in one of the nerve paths, and then they will, will develop severe pain. And many, of them, many of them will scream. And of course, that's why many of them are misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia. So I will do peripheral nerve examination with pressure testing and see if that's positive. Now, I will proceed by doing uh, a general myotome examination for, for the arm. So, I will do first C5, that shoulder abduction, the C5 nerve. Then I will proceed, proceed with the biceps test. So, the, the patient is lying supine. That's a C5-6 musculocutaneous nerve. Then I will do, uh, I will have them pinch their fingers together and I will try to rip them apart. That's C5-6 median nerve. Then I will do wrist extension, that C6 uh, radial nerve. Wrist flexion, look, I'm not tensing up the fingers, I'm keeping the fingers straight and bending the wrist, and I'm resisting there. Wrist flexion, that's a combined ulnar and median nerve, C6-7. Then I will go to the triceps elbow extension, that's a C7 radial nerve, and finally, uh, fifth finger opposition, that's the ulnar nerve, C8. Generally, in TOS, we see either C7 or C8 or both affected. So, weakness of the triceps and the fifth finger. That's because the lower trunk, the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus, is more susceptible for compression uh, between the first rib and the collarbone than the other parts of the brachial plexus. If there is noted weakness, or even if there's not, I will proceed with the more common test done. So I will do, uh, first of all, the Eden's test. The Eden's test is a costoclavicular compression test, and there's a couple of pitfalls here. Number one, a lot of patients that have con continuous compression in the costoclavicular area, they develop numbness. So when you do the test, they might not get pain uh, immediately. So you have them pull their shoulders back and squeeze them down and have them hold them there. Don't just do the test and look for pain. Don't do that. Have them hold them there for a good 20 to 30 seconds. And you're not always gonna get excruciating pain, although the patient's clinical, uh, clinical symptoms might be very aggressive due to numbness, which is common in, in chronic mechanical compression. So gradually, you sometimes you get a frank positive test right away, but usually you're gonna see gradual onset of tightness and stiffness that runs down into the chest, uh, armpit down the arm into the shoulder blade. That's a positive test, all right. Then I will proceed with the Roos test. Now, there's a couple of uh, pitfalls also in the Roos test. So the Roos test is basically putting your arms up and open and close as fast as you can. And you should be able to do that easily for about well, at least 30 seconds, probably a minute. If the test is, like, if the patient barely can get their shoulders up and you see they're struggling from the get-go, then there's obviously a positive test. But a common cheat that these borderline patients do is that, well, first of all, they brace their entire bodies, which is not really appropriate. And then you will see that instead of fully opening and fully closing, they just barely open their fingers like this. Can you see that when I go a little slower? They just barely, marginally open their fingers and that, that will enable them to go on for much longer than if they completely open and completely close. So that's one cheat, um, that's one cheat to look for. Next, I will proceed with a Morley's test. When we do the Morley's test, you basically put your fingers right there into the brachial plexus outlet on the side of the patient's neck and you squeeze into there. We are not necessarily looking for a positive tidal sign. A tidal sign is where you, there, there's frank radiation down the arm. We're not necessarily looking for that. We're looking for abnormal amount of pain elicited. So if you get a tidal sign, you hold it a little bit to get the tidal sign, I mean, great, that's great. But even if you don't, it's still a positive moralist test, all right? So you string your fingers over there, patient screams, that's a positive test. 
do it on both sides. If the test is positive on the side that the patient doesn't have any pain, symptoms, pre-existing symptoms, and it's negative on the side where they have symptoms, that usually signifies numbness. Uh, the numbness part is a little bit difficult to, to, to explain, so I, will, I might go through that in a different video. And then finally, we will do something called a Selmanowski's white hand sign. So both of the, the patients will raise both of their arms completely. This is not easy to see on video, but you're looking for paleness of the palms, carcass-like paleness. It could be, bi can be unilateral, can be bilateral, that's a positive sign for positional um, subclavian artery insufficiency, okay? You know, also, when you put the arms down again, you have the palms up, you will see redness flushing into the fingers, and that's post-ischemic vasodilation. That's a positive sign of previous uh, mild ischemia, okay? Another thing to note is that sometimes if you do the, the strength exam, especially patients that are not that afflicted, the strength exam can be normal. Then you do the Eden's test to squeeze back and down for a good 30 seconds. You redo the myotome examination, the strength exam, and now they have weakness. And that's a very specific sign that there is indeed costoclavicular affection here. And this is going to apply generally to patients who don't have a lot of everyday pain, but maybe pain only when they go to the gym, for example, or do something more strenuous. And now, finally, I was talking a little bit, little bit about the Doppler examination. Now, the problem with the problem with first, first and foremost, let's talk about electrodiagnosis. Studies show that neurographies are generally normal in TOS patients, even when there's proven uh, proven TOS. There was one study done by Rusev, and they found that. If, I'm, if I remember correctly, it was eight, 18 out of 20 patients with obvious proven clinical TOS had completely normal neurographic examinations. So if your doctor sends you to an EMG and NCV and it's normal and they use that as proof that you don't have TOS, no. No, that's not proof. That that's 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 nothing. Okay, so EDX electrodiagnostic studies helpful if they're positive, but they're generally not positive, and that can mislead the clinician that is responsible for the patient. Next thing is uh, the vascular workups. There's a couple of things you need to know with the vascular workup. When you do the TOS, MR, or CT angiogram, this is done with your arms up. Okay. Now, for patients that have gross scapular dyskinesia or a lot of tightness in their pec minor, they might get that uh, subclavian artery compression to a severe degree when they raise their arms. Other patients, they only get that if they put their shoulders back and down, squeeze them back and down, and this is not done as a part of the MR and CT protocols. That's why I prefer to do ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound, um, if you know how to do it properly, okay? So for the Doppler, you will have the, you will first, first measure the patient uh, with the arm neutral, uh, head, sorry, head to the opposite side because that unstretches, it relaxes the scalene, and you measure that axillary artery. As you proceed to go to arms up position, for, mainly for the pec minor, okay? Now you, you pull, you head to the same side to stretch that anterior scalene and you pull down and to the opposite side and now you elevate that arm. Once again, measure the axillary arch. And for the last test, neck is gonna be in the same position, but now you squeeze that shoulder back and down and measure the axillary arch. This is usually the test that's gonna be positive, and of course it's never done in the MRA and CTA, and therefore, and it's the most important test, which is why I recommend Doppler examinations over uh, MR and CTA if your physician knows how to do it properly. Now, if it's not done properly, it's going to be futile and it's better to get the MR uh, angiogram done. So I hope this video was informative. Uh, it's an interesting and also very important topic. TOS is very underdiagnosed. Uh, so let me know in the comments what you think about this video.
and I wish you all a great day.